Dank u wel for this invitation here today to speak at this institute and this university. Um, I'm very grateful for this uh, wonderful opportunity. And I'm also honored uh, to be here to, um, honored to be here with um, Professor Blumstein, who has done so much to promote uh, Christian spirituality. The inspiration of this lecture on brokenheartedness, a theme in Christian spirituality, it's a question mark, comes from an article that I read some years ago in The Economist about Jewish-Christian dialogue. The unnamed author points out that in the mystical tradition of Christianity and Judaism, and indeed Islam, there is much reflection on the principle of brokenheartedness. This is not meant in the ordinary sense of sadness or despair. It's a spiritual state in which the hard shell of arrogance and self-centeredness that encompasses the human heart somehow melts away in order for the divine love to come flooding in. Christians and Jews have encountered one another through the prism of arrogant worldly power. If Christians can approach Jews with broken hearts, which is not the same as abandoning their own beliefs, the tragedy of history may at some level be transcended. Well, this passage from The Economist spurred me to ask just how central is brokenheartedness to the Christian mystical tradition? And how could a recovery of it serve contemporary spirituality, contemporary Christians involved in dialogue? So in order to respond to these two interrelated questions, I will focus on two points. First, I want to ask the question, how the heart is a core symbol in Christian spirituality? And I'd like to try to explain what brokenheartedness or brokenness of heart means in the Christian tradition by offering a brief overview of how the term is used. Obviously, this can't be exhaustive, but I hope it will convince you that there exists enough evidence to argue that this theme is an important one for Christian spirituality. Second, I want to explore in detail what one 14th century mystic, Catherine of Siena, says about brokenness of heart and how she relates it to the theme of conversion. Now by conversion, in this case, I'm speaking about how Christians themselves can be more open to God's transforming love and so experience an ongoing conversion, an ongoing conversion that has a direct impact on action. Now, to unpack this, the implications of Catherine's teachings for today, I want to make use of Bernard Lonergan's writings on religious experience and conversion. And once this theme has been developed, I will conclude by suggesting why brokenheartedness could be an important theme for Christians approaching others in dialogue. So that is my plan of action. I will cut down part of this and the rest of it will be uh, published later on. But let me just begin with some preliminary comments about uh, the importance of symbols and images in religious discourse. In his book, The Prophetic Imagination, 
Walter Brueggemann has suggested that symbols are especially helpful for cutting through numbness and self-deception. In fact, he argues that one of the roles of the prophets is to offer symbols, to reactivate out of our historical past symbols that always have become vehicles of redemptive honesty. I'd like to suggest that the symbol of the heart is a vehicle for redemptive honesty. As a primordial word, heart can be considered a symbol that says something about a person's center, depth, and root unity. Even daily speech distinguishes between a heartless person and one who is all heart. The word heart easily defies definition, and like all symbols, it cannot be fully grasped. Nevertheless, seeing the heart as a place where freedom, affectivity, and consciousness dwell is common to most cultures and finds its ways in the vocabulary and of the world religions. Thus, reflecting on the heart could also serve as a natural point for interreligious dialogue. Brokenheartedness is an even more obvious point of departure for dialogue. And in this context, it especially can serve, I believe, as a vehicle for redemptive honesty. Brokenheartedness, of course, can evoke emotions of sadness, for example, at the cause of the suffering caused by hunger, war, natural disaster around the globe. There is another aspect that is also emphasized in the Christian tradition. And as the Economist article noted, this is not meant in the ordinary sense of sadness or despair. It's a spiritual state in which the hard shell of arrogance and self-centeredness that encases the human heart somehow melts away in order for the divine love to come flooding in. Now this understanding of brokenheartedness is worth exploring because it shows how it can be a vehicle for entering into and being transformed by the mystery of God's redeeming love. Now, an obvious point of departure for developing this theme is, of course, sacred scripture. Because even a cursory grant, grant, glance shows that heart is a core symbol in, the, in scripture. In the Hebrew scriptures alone, the term occurs 853 times. 853 times. I won't look at all of those times right now. <laughs> Mainly, though, in a figurative rather than a literal sense. To briefly summarize, the human heart is used basically in four different ways. First, as the source of rational functions. It's the place of thought and reason. And second, as the source of decision, purpose, and planning. And third, as the center of emotion, the place of courage, joy, sorrow, pride, or lust. And finally, as the place where religion and moral conduct is rooted. It's the place of fear of the Lord, trust in God, fidelity, purification, and conversion. Now, there are two passages in the Hebrew scriptures which can serve as an example of how the term is used. A broken and contrite heart is mentioned both in Psalm 51 and in Psalm 147. Psalm 51 finds its way not only into Jewish and Christian penitential liturgies, 
It's often part of the personal prayer of many. For example, the, the, the desert dweller Charles de Foucault called it the daily prayer of Christians. The pertinent passage that we're all familiar with are for passages for our focus are verses 8 and verses 15 to 17 where the psalmist says, Pray, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and steadfast spirit within me. And then the author goes on and says, For you are not pleased with sacrifice. The sacrifice acceptable to you is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So the full impact of these startling statements becomes evident when one realizes that instead of offering God a burnt offering, the psalmist offers himself, his broken and contrite heart, as the victim of sacrifice. And the immediate context in this case is the confession of sin and an awareness of God's saving mercy and steadfast love. One of the important dimensions of this psalm is to recognize that only God can create a, a new heart. In fact, in the Hebrew Bible, the verb to create is predicated only of God. No one else can accomplish this new creation. Granted, this requires a shattering of the old, but what is shattered is not lost. The old is in the new. And so the dismantled self, characterized by verse 17, requires a shattering of one's spirit, a brokenness of one's heart. True worship, as one author says, and new living require a yielding of self to begin again on God's terms. But the brokenness may not be a psychological dismantling. It may as well be an economic unburdening, a political risking, a stepping away from whatever form of power we've used by which to secure ourselves. Clearly there are other times in the Hebrew scriptures where brokenness of heart is referred to, and the reasons can be varied, suffering, persecution, and sorrow. The occasion of a contrite and broken heart can also be re recognition of God's judgment on one's sin or the sins of others. The other passage that I briefly want to mention is from Psalm 147, verses 2 and 3. And here, the psalmist employs the language of healing the brokenness, healing the broken heart to celebrate God's saving action towards the both post-exilic community in their struggling against political oppression and economic uh, adversity, a theme that's very useful in these days. This rending or breaking makes a new life possible. It's the raw, terrible tearing that opens up healing and makes new. A broken-hearted person contrasts with a hard-hearted one. The key difference is when confronted with sin, the former repents. The brokenness of their natural confidence in life and self points to a condition of frightful anguish and despair vis-a-vis -vis God. But such bottomless despair mysteriously conceals within itself the miracle of nearness to God. So to summarize this, the brokenhearted person is, pleased, is pleasing to God not simply because he or she lacks arrogance and is humble, but above all because this experience leads one to trust no longer in one's own resources but in God's mercy and steadfast love. So, through a broken heart, God enters. From a broken heart, God's love flows out to others. And in the Christian tradition, 
Christ crucified with the blood and water flowing from his pierced side is the one who has embraced brokenness. And various expressions of Christian spirituality in both the patristic and the medieval period with their symbolic interpretation of John 1934, one of the soldiers pierced his side with the spear and at once blood and water came out. This has provided Christians with an opportunity to contemplate Christ's heart, a manifestation of his love which is like a life-giving fountain from which we receive his spirit, the sacraments, and the church. During Jesus' life, during his life, Jesus describes his own mission in terms of healing the brokenhearted. Both in life and death, he proclaims the compassion of God. And one of the one of the trans one way of translating the Greek word for compassion is to say that it means to let one's innards embrace the feeling or situations of another. And some scholars would even describe Jesus' prophetic ministry in terms of the beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, the scriptural theme of brokenheartedness is carried on in the Desert Fathers and in the early monastic period with the idea of penthos. And one could say that it developed as a microcosm of the macro issues alluded to in sacred scripture. And even a cursory glance at the monastic tradition shows that these are various expressions of brokenheartedness. And there is a lot that one could say about penthos and uh, brokenheartedness in the monastic tradition, but I'm going to uh, leave that. In the, the full text, I do say a word about Evagrius' prayer and penthos, along with tears, mentioned in the East, and then I talk a bit about Gregory, Gregory the Great, the doctor of compunction in the West. But I'm going to leave that to leave enough time to speak about St. Catherine of Siena as a medieval case study about how brokenheartedness um, emerges in the tradition. In the medieval period, this theme emerges, emerges uh, in various uh, women mystics. Uh, one might mention briefly uh, Hildegard of Bingen, Angela Foligno, and Julian of Norwich. The development revolves around not only the link between brokenheartedness, compunction, and tears, but also on the pierced heart of Christ as a locus for experiencing the transforming love of God. And so now I come to Catherine of Siena and her teaching on brokenheartedness and how it's related directly to the idea of continual conversion in her letters. So as a way of entering into this, I want to explore her, first of all, um, her heart symbolism. And then from there, I'll move to the theme of brokenheartedness. Catherine's insights into brokenheartedness emerge not only out of her reflection on Christ crucified, on, on the love of Christ manifest through his pierced heart, but also from living in a society and in a church that was broken in many ways. The 14th century was an age of adversity and anxiety, where, for example, the plague ravaged most of Europe and sowed seeds of fear and isolation. The mortality rate was erratic, but the overall estimate is that a third of the people in Europe died. As one chronicler in Siena wrote, and no bells tolled, and nobody wept, no matter what the, his loss, because everyone expected death. And people said, 
and believed, this is the end of the world. Recent studies emphasize that the plague is considered the second greatest catastrophe in human record, with only World War II producing more death, destruction, and emotional suffering. And the church, instead of being a beacon of hope, was itself in disarray from its political quarrels, the Avignon Papacy, and the Great Western Schism. Until 1377, the papal court remained in Avignon when Gregory XI, influenced by Catherine of Siena and others, eventually brought the papacy back to Rome. Upon his death a year later, the Italian Urban VI was elected pope by the College of Cardinals, but his irascible character caused considerable friction with some of the cardinals, and they consequently elected the uh, Robert of Geneva, Pope Clement VII, thus beginning the Western Schism. Now Catherine was brokenhearted by the disunity and disruption this caused the church, and she actually wrote letters to some of these instigating cardinals, calling them devils incarnate, and suggesting that their poison of selfishness was destroying the world. So how did Catherine deal with brokenheartedness, the, deal with the brokenness that she saw in society and in the church? As a woman of God, she opened herself to God's fiery love that broke into her own heart. Her own experience of ongoing conversion influenced not only the way she reflected on the social and ecclesial problems of her time, but what she did to effect change, both socially and in the church. As a woman of the church, she loved the church, not with a blind love or rose-colored glasses, but with a love clothed with truth. She acknowledged that many in the church were leprous, these are her words, not mine, infected by greed, pride, arrogance, rebellion, and schism. These are just a few of the descriptive words that she used. And in light of these problems, she insisted on reform, but was convinced that reform must con come from within and that in a certain sense, reform began with taking upon herself responsibility through continuous prayer, work, and sacrifice. Above all, Catherine was a woman of hope in an age of anxiety. She responded to these crises by trying to stimulate her contemporaries to overcome their anxiety, apathy, fear, and fatalism by doing something to affect change. So it's in this context that we want to look at Catherine's writings on the heart. The word heart occurs 764 times in her writings. I won't review them all with you today. Without a doubt, it is a significant symbol for her. For Catherine, the heart emerges as the physical reality it is but more as the seat of all human and analog analogically godly response. And so we find expressions <laughs> such as heart and spirit, heart and affection, cold heart, hard heart, lift up your heart. It's in the heart that good and evil thoughts reside from the heart that good and evil designs um, come within the heart that God dwells. Now how does her focus on the heart fit in with the theme, with this theme in her writings? Noting how tight knit Catherine's writings are, Suzanne Nofke suggests that her images and symbols dance around one another so that it's sometimes difficult to extricate one symbol from another. Nevertheless, one can argue that for Catherine, in the words of Nofke, God is truth 
love. Truth that is love and love that is truth, revealed in Jesus Christ and discovered in knowledge of oneself and knowledge of God in oneself. And the reality that stands as symbol at the heart of this dynamism is the heart. The heart of Jesus as revelation of the heart of God and the human heart as drawn to respond to the heart of divinity engrafted into humanity. For Catherine, the transformation of the human heart is intricately intertwined with coming to know the truth revealed in the heart of Christ, namely that God is madly in love. Pazzo d'amore, this is the word that she uses. Pazzo d'amore for us. Pazzo d'amore, God is madly in love with humanity. And this love is most poignantly manifest in Christ crucified. Specifically, the secret of the heart, il segreto del cuore, is revealed in the pierced heart of Christ. When Catherine questions why Christ's heart was pierced after his death, the response is, there were many reasons, but I shall tell you the chief one. My longing for humankind was infinite, but the actual deed of bearing pain and torment was finite and could never show all the love I had. This is Christ, God speaking to Catherine. This was why I wanted you to see the secret of my heart, wanting to show it to you, open up so that you would see that I love you more than finite suffering can show. So because the human heart is always drawn by love, this revelation is also an invitation to enter into the love through contemplation. Catherine uses very earthy images that may seem very strange to us today. And yet, if we let her speak to us, she says something important about brokenheartedness. Christian conversion and its impact on our relationship with other people. Now, if you read through the biography of Catherine by Raimondo da Capua, her spiritual director and one of her key admirers, you will find all sorts of stories typical of the genre of a saint's biography of her time. But if you kind of put aside the flowery language and the sentimental language and dig deep, you discover that the symbol of the heart is a vehicle for talking about different levels of ongoing conversion in Catherine's life. And one of those scenes is the exchange of hearts, which is an important theme in, in the medieval period. There's actually a sculpture in Rome, a little sculpture in the church of, the, in the Basilica of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, where you see, um, a picture, a, a sculpture of Christ who seems to be removing Catherine's heart at, while at the same time checking her pulse. I like that so much. Um, anyway, the point of all this is that the deep, deeply symbolic significance is that she was wounded by God's love. She was transformed by God's love revealed in Christ. And in the symbol of the heart, being, being in love with God and doing, doing God's will intersect. So this convergence, convergence of being and doing is fundamental to Catherine's heart symbolism and that is what I want to explore briefly right now in some of her letters. Now Catherine's letters have rightly been considered the practical dimension of her theology. Of the more than 380 letters written to all sorts of people, including popes and prisoners, queens and prostitutes, to intimate friends and relatives, to persons Catherine never meant, met, there were probably some people who would have been just as happy not to get a letter from Catherine of Siena. <laughs> 
these letters are replete with references to heart problems, though they are not the ones that we usually talk about today. Catherine was well aware, though, that we, that they are not, so Catherine was well aware of the foibles of the human heart. She recognized that one could genuinely block God's grace because of hardness of heart, durezza di cuore, or because of stubbornness of heart, un cuore ostinato, a cold or chilled heart, freddezza di cuore, falsity of heart, un cuore fitto, or a deceptive or double heart, un cuore doppio, for Catherine, these heart problems are signs of the need for conversion. Just to give you one example, Catherine touches on the theme of hardness of heart more than 40 times in her writings. And typical of her use of the term is her comment to Bernabo, Bernardo's, Bernardo Visconti, one of Milan's most notorious tyrants who influenced politics on the Ita Italian peninsula for 30 years. He was a bit of a scoundrel who had been excommunicated twice for his violent political opposition to the papacy. We don't know why Catherine wrote him or what his response was. But it's quite interesting that Catherine took time to write not only to this hard-hearted man, but also to his wife, Regina de la Scala, who has been described by Suzanne Nofke as an imperious, avaricious, ambitious, and treacherous woman. So, a happy couple. What we see in letter 28 to this tyrant, Visconti, is not only a summary of Catherine's whole theology of creation and redemption, but also her conviction that the power of God's love can bring about a change of heart. She writes, what heart is so hard and stubborn that it would not melt contemplating the effect of love, divine goodness bears it. Love, then love. Ponder the fact that you were loved even before you loved. And then she goes on with a very long passage about this love revealed in creation and redemption. Now here what Catherine is doing is she's showing how Christ takes upon himself the brokenness of humanity through his incarnation. And later in the letter, she reflects on the impact of the crucifixion on humanity. Let me quote a short passage. What indescribable love. By his death, he has given us life. By enduring insult and abuse, he has restored our dignity. With his hands nailed fast to the cross, he has freed us from the shackles of sin. With his pierced heart, he has done away with our hard-heartedness. In being stripped, he has clothed us. Specifically, Catherine was convinced that if this pierced love pierced Visconti's heart, it would have an effect on his behavior in a concrete way. For example, she suggests, instead of being a gangrenous member of the church, he would become a faithful son. He would be set free from sin and given freedom to do God's will. We don't know how he responded to her advice. But it's interesting that this 28-year-old woman had the courage to write this notorious scoundrel, 
this notorious tyrant with this call to conversion. Fire is another symbol that Catherine uses to describe how to overcome hard heartedness. Fire breaks up, purifies, and destroys, but out of it, new life can emerge. For example, in a letter to the Archbishop of Pisa, suggesting that an experience of God's fiery love would bring about a change of heart in him, she concludes by saying, bathe yourself in the blood of Christ crucified, where you will find the fire of love. It will consume every chill and dissolve any hardness of your heart or your soul. Thus, the hard heart, the cold heart, becomes warm and pliable because of the fire of divine love. So friends, these are a few of the heart problems mentioned by Catherine, along with a hint at how she proposes to solve the heart problems. Her language is quite strong. And I'd like to conclude this section with a poignant passage from the dialogue where she recognize, recognizes that some people have, with the hand of free choice, encrusted their heart in a diamond rock. A diamond rock. She says that this hardness can never be shattered except by blood. And paradoxically, this is both gift and responsibility. It's gift because of the gratuitous love of God manifest in Christ crucified and the shedding of his blood. It's responsibility because only through free will can they be can can it be poured can they pour the blood of Christ over the hardness of hearts. The image of the heart as hard as diamonds, occurs various times in her writings. And it's helpful to know that there was an old medieval legend that argued that the only way to break up a diamond was to pour blood on it. Catherine utilizes this legend and argues that the only way to break up a hard heart is through being flooded by the blood of Christ. For her, blood is a symbol of the fiery love of God that literally breaks up a hard heart. So, so far, all of these various images converge into one fundamental concept. A healthy heart is a broken heart. In Catherine's heart, thought, a healthy heart is one that is free, libero, and simple, schietto. It's, in short, a heart that has been stripped of all that blocks one from reaching out to God and to others in love. The healthy heart has been broken, spezzato, through an experience of God's love manifest in Christ. And this love causes it to burst. She talks about scoppio cuore with love. One example of how this latter image of the heart bursting uh, emerges in one of Catherine's 11 letters to her good friend and disciple, Neri di Landoccio Pagliaresi, written probably sometime in 1376. Now, to this Sienese nobleman, politician, and poet, Catherine writes, I, Catherine, servant and slave of the servants of Jesus Christ, am writing to you in his precious blood. We don't normally begin our emails that way. <laughs> but Catherine began almost all of her letters in this way. She says, I long to see you united with and transformed in the fire of blazing charity so that you may be a vessel of love to carry the name of God's word and his great mysteries 
before our dear Christ on earth and to be effective in igniting his desire. So the context of the letter is that Neri is on the way to Avignon to join Raymond of Capua in trying to encourage Gregory XI to return to Rome. And so she's convinced that this nobleman is an important instrument for the reform of the church. But she recognizes that this, recognizes that this will only happen if he contemplates Christ's pierced heart and receives from Christ a desire and a strength to do God's will. And then she assures him that if you do this, your words and actions will become like an arrow drawn, listen to this language, an arrow drawn red hot out of the fire, that wherever it is shot sends on fire everything it strikes, since it cannot help sharing what it has. <coughs> So think of your soul as entering the fiery furnace of divine charity, and love's power will make you shoot out and share what you have drawn from the fire. So in other words, contemplating Christ's pierced heart, Christ, Catherine says that Mary will discover the depths of Christ's love that will impact his life. Now she comes to the important part of the letter that focuses on the heart bursting with love. How could a heart be so hard and stubborn as not to burst? Contemplating it, we can only be like flax stubble thrown into the fire. It can't help burning since it's the nature of fire to burn and to transform into itself whatever comes near it. So we, when we contemplate our Creator's love, are drawn at once to love Him and turn our affection completely to Him. In Him all dampness of selfishness is dried up and we take on the likeness of the Holy Spirit's fire. Now, up to this point, I've shown various heart problems described by Catherine. Her conviction that a healthy heart is a broken heart, and a few examples of how she talks about a change of heart in her writings. Another way of arguing my point is to say that brokenheartedness is a symbol of ongoing conversion or transformation. And in the very short time I have left, um, I just want to mention briefly that I see um, in Bernard Lonergan uh, a way of unpacking Catherine's uh, symbolic language here. Because for Lonergan, conversion is, a fundament is fundamental to religious living. It involves a transformation of the subject in his or her world. Lonergan says, it directs one's gaze, his gaze, I use his language, pervades his imagination, releases the symbols that penetrate to the depths of the psyche. Now my suggestion is that the brokenhearted, wounded, um, I would suggest that the broken heart, wounded by divine love, is one such symbol. Consistently in Catherine's writings, there's only one solution for the heart problems that I mentioned early. It's an experience of God's love. For her, this love is most poignantly manifest in Christ crucified, whose heart was open for love of humanity. And in a way, in all three letters we've looked at, to, Rome, to Milan's most notorious scoundrel, to the Archbishop of Pisa, and to the gentle gentleman, the noble politician of Siena, her suggestion is that they fall in love with God. And this, as you may know from Lonergan, is a key theme in his um, writings. So just to conclude, let me say, um, just talk about briefly the, the, the dynamism that I see at work. What's happening here? An, an experience of God, God's love overflows or floods a person. 
And this is why self-knowledge and knowledge of God is so crucial for Catherine's spirituality. Though this is a pure gift, Catherine is convinced that there are certain things that we can do to open ourselves up to this gift. As one becomes open to this gift, the hard heart, the cold heart, becomes warm and pliable because of the divine love. And this was illustrated in her image of the heart as hard as diamonds being broken up by the blood of Christ. For Catherine, blood is a symbol of the fiery love of God. I found a beautiful passage by uh, Professor Hein, hein Blum, Blumenstein, um, whom we're honoring today, where he, in a different context, he states something very similar, and I quote him. Once we start loving and surrendering ourselves to that overpowering, overwhelming power of God's unconditional love, it seems that we are dragged along in, an, in a bottomless whirlpool. The contemplation of God's incompre incomprehensible tender love sets free in us the desire to love more and more. We hear the passionate invitation, love the love. Catherine would be very happy with that. <laughs> the second point, the love, affects in the person both an intellectual and a moral transformation. Insofar as a person cooperates, he or she gradually moves from an egoistical, self-centered life to a God-centered life. And this experience of God's love has an impact on the way that Catherine thought about the reform of the church and the big political problems of her time. If you think we have big problems, go back to the 14th century. <laughs> the third point is this. The heart becomes simple, not two-faced, big, not stingy. It has room for others. Indeed, it has space to welcome the world. The broken-hearted person doesn't feel threatened by others. In one of her favorite prayers, prayed towards the end of her life, Catherine says to God, You, light, make the heart simple. In Italian, it's very beautiful. Fai el cuore schietto e non doppio. Not two-faced. You make it big, not stingy, so big that it has room in its loving charity for everyone. This change of heart is manifest not only in words, but in deeds. And basically, she's saying that as Christians open themselves again and again to divine love, it will lead them from an egocentric life to a life of service. If I may conclude very briefly with a word about dialogue. Why would this theme be important for dialogue? Can the theme of brokenheartedness be useful for dialogue today? I would say yes. Because the Christian who is involved in dialogue needs to let go of hardness of heart, arrogance, and self-centeredness. An experience of God's love purifies one's relations with others in dialogue and could lead one to let go of anything that approaches an attitude of condensation, condescension to the other's religion. Accepting the full implication of brokenheartedness can purify us so that we approach others freely, simply, with a heart on fire with God's love. Above all, I think a broken heart helps us to maintain a proper balance between confidence in our Christian vocation and humility before the wonders of God manifest in so many ways. What I hope to have shown today, especially in the writings of Catherine, is in the words of the economist, the brokenheartedness is a spiritual state 
in which the hard shell of arrogance and self-centeredness that encases the human heart somehow melts away in order for the divine love to come flooding in. I conclude by asking, is this not the best preparation for dialogue with others?